why did these people continue to worship Baal after seeing that kind of proof? Because they wanted to. It's just that simple. They liked living in Baal's world. They liked living with the worldview that they can make God into whatever they want, and they, they have a God that doesn't judge them, and they can, I mean, how relevant does this sound to today? That they can make a judge that a God that doesn't judge them and approves of all their life choices and is on their side and is powerful and can smite the people that they don't like, whether or not they're actually just or morally correct or not. They liked Bill better. Because Bill was more like them. <laughs> Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Kings. Now to give you some background information for the verses that we're going to read, this is an episode in the scripture about Elijah. And Elijah goes to Mount Carmel, which I know sounds like a candy store, but no, really, it is a, it is a mountain in ancient uh, Israel. So Elijah has been on the run for some time, several years at this point, because the worshipers of Baal want to snuff him out because he's against the worship of Baal. And so as a dedicated monotheist, one who worships the almighty one true God versus idols like Baal, he has been actively against Jezebel and King Ahaz, or sorry, King Ahab, for a long time now. And they've been trying to hunt him down, they've been trying to take him out, but he has not done this. And so what he does is he, he basically offers a challenge to the Baal worshippers. And this is so cool, the way that he does this. And if you understand the context of this, it makes it that much cooler. Mount Carmel was sacred to Baal. So... Because of that, because the Baal worshippers saw this mountain as sacred holy ground for the god Baal, Elijah's like, oh, I'm going to beat your god, and I'm going to do it on his home turf. So they go to Carmel, and he says, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to decide who is really God. And what I want you to do is, we're going to take an offering, and you're going to put it on your altar and stack up the wood and everything else, and what you're going to do is you're going to cry out to Baal for him to send fire from heaven to consume the offering. And they're like, yep, this, this sounds like a good plan. And so the Baal worshippers are there all day long, from, from morning to just around sunset. And they are crying out to Baal. They are literally cutting themselves and letting themselves bleed. They are screaming out. And, and he has 400 prophets of Baal. And they're on Baal's mountain. And all of this stuff is going on. Baal has every advantage here, and nothing happens for hours on end. And Elijah's like poking fun at him. He's like, oh, maybe, maybe Baal's asleep. Maybe he's gone on a journey, and he needs it. And so there's a lot of jeering and sort of like smack talk going on from Elijah, which I love as a sarcastic person. And then Elijah goes, all right, guys, I want you to fill up several barrels of water and dig a giant trench around my altar. And they do it. And they pour the water on there, and they pour the water on there again, and they pour the water on there again. And so the entire altar, the offering, everything is just drenched at this point. They said that the trough sitting around this altar would fill up several baths, which is a, a measurement in, in ancient Israel. And uh, Elijah basically just says, all right, God, send down the fire. And I mean, no... no pomp, circumstance, not everything that they've been going through with like cutting themselves and, and making fools of themselves. And, and God sends a fire so hot that it consumes the offering, the altar, and the water around it in a matter of moments. And then he says, oh, and by the way, you, know, you guys know how there's been like a drought for three years now? Yeah, God's about to send the rain, so you better get inside quick. And he does, and, and there's, it goes from basically clear skies, and it hasn't rained in Israel in three years at this point to a torrential downpour. 
And so Elijah is kind of on cloud nine at this point, and why wouldn't he be? He's like, okay, I've convinced Israel to go out and kill all the prophets of Baal. There, there was a great battle there where 400 of their prophets were killed. Um, you know, God won this battle. And you can forgive Elijah for thinking that. Based on what he has just seen, he's like, okay, seriously, how could anybody not see that and think, yep, Elijah's God is definitely the real God, and, and this Baal guy, he doesn't know what he's doing because he obviously can't do what Elijah's God does. So in Elijah's mind, he just won this fight. But what actually happens afterward is that Jezebel says, I'm going to make you exactly like the prophets of Baal that you just killed. I'm coming after you even harder than before. And so Elijah has to flee for his life. He is running scared. And that's got to be an emotional roller coaster. Based on the distance between where he is at Mount Carmel and where he winds up, we think that this journey could have taken several days, even if he was you know, moving at a pretty quick place. And, and he's running for his life. So he gets to where he gets to this little cave out in the middle of nowhere, and he's exhausted, he's frustrated. He thought that he was going to be on top of the mountain at this point, and he can't figure out why, after pretty clear convincing evidence that God is definitely who he says he is and Baal is nothing. Why is it that all the Baal worshippers, at least the, the ones in charge or the ones at the top, why is it that it seems like they're winning? That doesn't make any sense. I just pro provided evidence that cannot be contradicted that God is who he says he is and, and Bill has no power at all. How could this happen? And there's a really great and, and frankly kind of sweet moment between God and Elijah where Elijah's just exhausted and angry and doesn't know what he's going to do. And God, he has a very sort of dad moment here, which I love. I mean, it's just, it's a great analogy for why God calls himself our father. Is He's like, all right, Elijah, go take a nap. I'm going to give you some food, and then we'll talk. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a very apparent thing to do. It's like, all right, we're not in a good mood to have this conversation right now. So you, you get some sleep, and then you have some breakfast, and, and we'll talk in the morning. And so, that's exactly what happens. And when they do wake up the next day, uh, or when, when Elijah wakes up the next day and has this conversation with God, God takes him outside the cave to stand up on this mountain that he's on. And that's really where the passage that we're going to read starts here. So this is 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13 So he said, this is the Lord talking here, So he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? God likes to settle. He does. He always has. Men, because we are not all powerful, and because we're inadequate, and because we're imperfect, we feel the need to show off a lot. You know, whether it's the, the kid that's trying to do a backflip to impress the girl that he likes because he thinks that somehow that's going to ingratiate himself to her, or whether it's you know a general or a, a president or a king or something like that showing off the armies that he commands, whatever form that takes, uh, or showing off a, a display of weaponry, something like that, we feel like we've got to show off all the time because we know we're really, at the end of the day, we're not immortal, we're not all that powerful, we're not all that great. And so because of that, sometimes we, we puff ourselves up to make ourselves look greater than we actually are. God doesn't do that because he doesn't need to. Why, why would God do that? I mean, he's literally all-powerful. He can make anything that he wants with a thought. So why would he be concerned with showing off? And because of that, 
God is always like doing things with the simple. I mean, look at Moses. He took down literally the greatest nation in all of human history up to that point with one dude and a stick. He took down the Roman Empire. He took down the Persians, the Greeks. I mean, he, he causes kingdoms to rise and fall with the simplest of things. And all through the Scripture, look at, for example, the Gospels. You had all these fake messiahs and people that were going out and performing these great deeds and magicians that would make this big show of it. And, and, and Jesus would just say to people like, yeah, get up and, and walk. And that was it. They were healed. Not a lot of ceremony. Not a lot of you know attention getting stuff. God does that occasionally. And he does it specifically to help us in our faith. Sometimes God does bring the fire like he did on Mount Carmel. But God likes the subtle. And I think that that's the lesson we're supposed to take from this. He brings forth this wind that is so strong, it's saying that it's shaking the mountains and breaking rocks in half. That's a strong wind. I've never seen wind do that. And then an earthquake, and then a fire, and all these big, fancy, amazing feats of nature that God can make any time He wants. Look, God's all-powerful. He could. He could literally just do that stuff constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week from now to the end of time, and he wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Wouldn't even be a strain on him. And yet he doesn't. Yet he chooses to come to Elijah this way. It says he wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in the fire, he wasn't in the earthquake. It says there was a gentle blowing, and then he spoke, and God's voice came to Elijah. He wanted to speak to Elijah in a whisper. God likes that. He prefers to speak to us in that method. And I think that, maybe not the whole reason, but part of the reason that God chooses to do it this way is because Elijah is sitting there thinking, how after everything that I've shown these people do they not believe that God is God? How do they not see it? How do they not bend the knee and worship the one and only Lord and creator of the universe, considering what I've just shown them is conclusive evidence that that's exactly who he is? And then this happens. And I think the message that we're supposed to take from this is God is saying, yeah, people are going to see my wonders, but that's not why they trust me. That's not why they worship me. That's not why they treat me as God. Why did these people continue to worship Baal after seeing that kind of proof? Because they wanted to. It's just that simple. They liked living in Baal's world. They liked living with the worldview that they can make God into whatever they want, and they, they have a God that doesn't judge them, and they can, I mean, how relevant is the sound of today? That they can make a judge that a God that doesn't judge them and approves of all their life choices and is on their side and is powerful and can smite the people that they don't like, whether or not they're actually just or morally correct or not. They liked Baal better. Because Baal was more like them. He was. God's not. God's not like us. He's like us in some ways, and we bear that spark of the divine, but ultimately we're not that much like God. And His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so even in the face of absolute conclusive proof, the wonders are not what inspire our faith in God. It's those that hear His voice. You see, they worship Baal because they would rather Baal actually be God. They would rather have a God that they can kind of bargain with and is, is more on their level. But when you worship a holy God, you don't have that luxury. When you worship the one true and eternal God, then you have to come to Him. You have to subject yourself to Him. And that requires a change in you. That requires you to give up something of yourself. Now, God's mercy and salvation may be free, but He does have expectations and requirements that He asks of you. And most people in ancient Israel and today, they are not willing to do that. And so that's why, even in the face of incontributable evidence, that it cannot be contradicted, that people will look at God and go, eh, 
Not, not for me. I'm good. We're fighting the same battle that ancient Israel did. It's the same choice since the beginning of time. Ultimately, we have a choice to make. And what this story really puts on display is that the people that really have faith are the ones that hear God's voice and do what He says. Not the ones that see the miracles. I mean, would it have been amazing to see Christ rise from the dead? Yeah, it would have been. Would it have been amazing to see Him heal the lame and, and cause blind people to see? Yeah, that would have been incredible. But that's not why we follow Him. We follow Him because of what He said and what He taught and the way that He loves us and the mercy that He had for us. That is why we have faith. Because we see who God is and we have a relationship with Him. And we seek after Him because He seeks after us. And because of that voice, because of the commands, because of what we read in the Scripture and, and the teachings that He has passed on to us, we respond to that with faith. We respond to that with submission to His will and obeying Him. That's what it means to have faith. To have belief plus obedience. I mean, the devil believes in God. I'm sure these people on Mount Carmel just saw what happened. They believe in God too. They didn't have faith. So always remember that, that the ones that are actually the faith bearers, the ones that actually have faith in God, not just belief or not just knowledge about God, the ones that actually have faith are the ones that read the words of Scripture, that read God's Word, that understand His commands, and then do it. That's what it really means to have faith. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.